All right. Fantastic. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Meg Trite. Um, and as the regional director of the Circle of Entrepreneurs North America, I'm really pleased to welcome you to spend some time with us here this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Here at the Circle, we truly believe that business can be both a profitable and a force for good. And the Circle of Entrepreneurs empowers people to drive social impact through business by nurturing a community of purpose-driven entrepreneurs and allies, providing a space where they can grow and flourish. And we are a global nonprofit movement of over 5,000. And I see some familiar faces from the circle here today. And I just wanna let you know that while we are passionate about social entrepreneurship, we are supportive of entrepreneurship and all that it encompasses. And thus today's topic is leveraging technology to scale entrepreneurship programs. Now today's agenda will be pretty casual. Uh, we'll open it up with conversation between myself and our special guest who I will uh, introduce uh, in a few minutes here. And then uh, we'll open it up to questions from you, the attendees, really have some chance for dialogue. Um, I just ask that you mute yourselves, uh, and, but feel free to share in the chat as we're having dialogue here today. Um, and I just wanna share just to kind of set, uh, set a baseline here for us. Um, as you can see on this slide I just pulled up, this is a program models chart that I created uh, really because I couldn't find anything out on the internet really. So I kind of created this myself, a repertoire of different program models for entrepreneurship. And this isn't entirely comprehensive, um, but it does encompass several models and mixtures of uh, commonly held models for entrepreneurship. So you'll notice some of these are like hack days, hackathons are very popular for instance. Um, but today we want to focus on the tool-centered model, uh, which being an entrepreneur myself, I, I really think can be beneficial to entrepreneurs in that it can really help to further develop the idea uh, that they have, reveal certain needs and opportunities or considerations that they might not have without a tool. Um, and I also like it because, you know, senior executives or CEOs, even middle management can benefit from having some guide rails that um, provide an opportunity uh, through the tool centered model. So we can maybe get some data and um, we'll dive more into this today, but I just wanted to share that with you. Um, but now I want to uh, uh, start our conversation here. And um, joining me for this conversation, we have a very special guest, uh, a good friend of mine, Gray Somerville, uh, who lives in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. And he is the co-founder of three startups, believe it or not, uh, the founder of Innovative 365 Days to Launch, uh, which is an entrepreneur development program uh, he was the author of 365 Days to Launch and a recognized expert on innovation and entrepreneurship. Now, prior to co-founding LaunchPath, which is a tool-centered model for entrepreneurship, if you haven't heard of it, he co-founded and led technological systems. I'm sorry, Teleological Systems, uh, a technology company providing competition-aware market marketing systems to the nation's leading communication service providers. Uh, he also served as a successful entrepreneur within a research and consulting firm where he created and grew a new product line to annual reven revenues in excess of 20% of the parent company's revenues. Really impressive there. And he, he really loves helping organizations and individuals achieving their full potential through proactive systematic innovation. Uh, that's his passion and vocation and sport. So welcome, Gray. Thank you for joining us. We are so happy to have you join this conversation. Meg, it's such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm sorry for having been involved in things with such difficult names. We'll try to be better <laughs> in the future. 
<laughs> Fantastic. Well, um, Gray, I'm just so happy to have you here. And uh, I know that you've owned other companies, which we talked about. Um, so I'm just curious, just to kind of kick us off here, why did you um, why did you decide to uh, choose to build Launchpath, an entrepreneurship platform? Yeah, well, it's a uh, it's a very personal passion. You you mentioned that um, part of my story was being a successful entrepreneur, and I've been a serial entrepreneur for the past twenty years. But my on ramp to all that was the successful entrepreneurship project. And you know when that happened, uh, kind of where where I was in my career journey was was uh, uh, you know it was a very uncertain time. I did not know how I was going to make it in the world, and um, maybe partly responding out of that, I began looking for opportunities that kind of were non obvious uh, within my within my organization. And I sort of stumbled upon this thing, and you know, I mean, there was a whole story there. There was a lot of work there, but um, I was able to uh, to achieve a success, both for me and for my company, that nobody had imagined before it before it happened. And I was kind of stunned by that. That you know, I mean, you're you're working so hard to find your path in this world, and all the different advice I'd gotten, nobody had ever said to me, "Hey, maybe you should be an entrepreneur." I didn't even know that word. So that that um, that kind of lit a long fuse that that has been burning for the past you know twenty years, um, and so when I when I exited my last company, and um, you know, to to quote Karl Popper, I was looking for you know the problem that I was going to fall in love with. My mind went back to that and thought, you know, if you if you could find a way to release more of that potential energy into the world, all the people out there who are just like me, who have a, you know, who have who have the potential to do things for their organizations that maybe no one has recognized yet, it would be absolutely, you know, it would be uh, absolutely something I'd be very proud of and kind of revolutionary. So that's what got me started on that path. Well, thank you, Gray. I think it's so cool. Not only have you been an unexpected, uh, inter successful entrepreneur helping your company uh, grow by 20% profits, so that's incredible, but then you went on to start other businesses. So yeah. I just really appreciate the perspective that I know that you can offer um, because of your career path. And so I want to kind of also ask about something that I'm really intrigued by. We were talking about data pre pre chat and and mm -hmm. I really keep an eye on entrepreneurship and and um, Google Trends and and I noticed that while terms like innovation and entrepreneurs are really wildly popular, entrepreneurship hasn't really hit that level of commonplace just yet. Um, so I wanted to ask like why do you think that it's taking entrepreneurship more time to become as popular as entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. Well, so one thing, I, I don't know what sources that you're looking at, but one, one thing I would just kind of add to the conversation is, um, uh, I think that if you do a Google trend search, you'll see that entrepreneurship has kind of, you know, it's at a plateau. If you look over the whole history of time, it kind of bumps around, but it's not, it's not trending upwards. Um, there's a, um, there's a, a large international study of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship that's done um, by GEM, which stands for the Global Entrepreneurship Program or something. It's an ongoing tracking study of this. And <clears throat> the most recent report I think came out in 2000, it might've been released in 2020, it was for the 2018-19 period. And it actually showed that in the United States, um, entrepreneurship had risen by 60%. Now you gotta remember that that's probably starting from a very low number. So it might've gone you know, from 5% to 7% or something like that. Um, but, I, but I was encouraged to see that you know, there, is, there is growth there. But back to your point, you know, whether it's growing or not, it still has not become you know, it hasn't become dominant. It hasn't become something that everybody is doing and understands. And I think there are probably a number of reasons for that. I think one is the whole concept of, of a corporation 
is a little bit antithetical to entrepreneurship, right? It's a big uh, centrally organized command and control economy kind of within this, this small economy. And, the, and the, whole, you know, the whole idea of how it's going to work is other people are going to figure out what you need to do and then tell you to do it as opposed to you're kind of finding your own path through that. So I think, I think there is, um, you know, entrepreneurship kind of challenges the norms of, of an organization. Um, and then the other thing that um, I think kind of comes and goes a little bit is just where the opportunity is for, for people. So in different kind of phases of the economy, the people who are the natural innovators, the people who want to create something, sometimes there are more incentives for them to leave the organization and kind of enter entrepreneur world. Sometimes there are more incentives for them to stay within the organization and pursue entrepreneurial opportunities. We've kind of been in a hot streak here re recently for startups. There's been a lot of funding and a lot of, you know, you can kind of imagine there's, there's been a little bit of a vacuum pulling people out of organizations. So that may be a factor as well. So those are, those are some thoughts I'm sure, I'm sure many others have, have other insights on that as well. Yeah, thank you for sharing that perspective. I think it's really interesting. I'll we'll just uh, maybe continue that conversation uh, uh, in times to come. But but kind of diving into our topic today of uh, really leveraging uh, technology to scale entrepreneurship programs. So, so Gray, why do you see companies needing a tool to really help engage their employee base with uh, the formation of an entrepreneurship program? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to say back what you asked there because I think they are, I think you, what you said is for the formation of an entrepreneurship program. And if, mm -hmm. and if I may, I want to make a little distinction between use of tools for sort of designing and implementing an entrepreneurship program versus the use of tools for scaling an entrepreneurship program. And I, and I clarify that just because, um, you know, I'm in conversations constantly with people who are grappling with some part or other of this challenge. And in a lot of people, when they hear the idea of a platform or a tool or a technology, their mind immediately goes to, well, that's what you need when you're ready to step on the gas and accelerate and scale this thing, right? Which is true, that's, a, that's an important use case. But there is equally an important use case for a entrepreneurship tool or platform when you are designing and implementing. And, and that I, I'll speak to that for just a minute. Why is that? I, I would just say that um, what you find as you engage the challenge of putting together an entrepreneurship program is just it's a it's a very complex system. Um, the, you know, the, the fundamentals of why that complexity exists is that, you know, under the hood, there are kind of like two fundamental problems that you have to solve. One is you need to, you need to recruit and develop entrepreneurs. You need, you know, the, the uh, probably at least 20% of your employees who kind of have ambitions in this area, you need to find those people and draw them in, but also you need to develop their capability. That's a very challenging thing to do uh, to, you know, that development path is hard. The other kind of fundamental problem that you need to solve is you need to align those innovators both with the, the, the true needs and wants of the organization, as well as with the true needs and wants of, of whoever their customers are, whether those are internal customers or external customers. And again, that's just a very complicated uh, challenge to, to make all that work. So, so like ideally, I, I would say when you're designing an entrepreneurship program, the place to start is by identifying sort of the investors or the, the leadership who will actually be paying for, for all of this. Identify their real, real needs and wants and then develop a system that comes in the end, kind of beginning with their goals all the way back to sourcing those early, you know, areas of opportunity that are going to be engaged and, and aligning the innovators around those. So it's a complicated system to, uh, to kind of support that end-to-end -end pipeline. And therefore, if you have a tool that has kind of thoughtfully, you know, worked on all of those details, it kind of provides a, you know, uh, 
a sort of a lattice work that you can that you can operate off of. Sure. No, I appreciate that, and I would say, from being an in aspiring entrepreneur myself, you know, just looking at um, having seen different tools, I have been able to identify areas where it would have helped me to better think through a plan or pitch it. So yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, and you talked about some key challenges and I just wanna open up uh, that discussion a little further. You know, what, if in your experience, what are some key challenges that you have seen companies um, have when considering starting an entrepreneurship uh, program that maybe a tool-centered model can really help with? Yeah, so I see um, the, the number one problem that I see is what I refer to as the bridge to nowhere problem. Um, you know, if you kind of put yourself in the shoes of, of the person who is trying to um, execute on this larger opportunity, we've got all these smart employees, we want to get them engaged and so forth. Um, there, there's always this feeling of urgency that, you know, just kind of in general, but I think especially in, in the world of innovation and entrepreneurship, we feel like if it doesn't happen in a day, then we're moving too slowly. And so, you know, okay, what we can get organized by next week is a big ideation session. We're gonna get all these ideas out. So we have an event, we get all these ideas and we cover the walls with those. But what, what typically fails to happen is, okay, what comes after that and after that and after that and after that. And unfortunately, you know, it's it's a it's a big challenging job to actually take one of those little sticky notes off the wall and turn it into something that's a, a growing and thriving part of the economy, right? That might be a years long process, and people haven't thought that through. So you see, you see these um, uh, these kind of pieces of a system. We have the hackathon over here. We have the Shark Tank event over here. We might even have a, you know, we might even have uh, some sort of incubator thing. But, but none of those connect in a way that actually leads to innovation being fully executed. Or I shouldn't say none. I, I wanna be very careful not to, um, um, not to in any way um, discourage anyone or, or denigrate the efforts of others because everybody, including me, are trying hard, right? We're all doing our best and nobody's figured it out completely either. Um, but, I, but I do think that's kind of part of the challenges. And, and then another thing that I would say is, I think that there's a, a kind of a mindset issue. I think that there are a number of people who have framed the challenge of innovation as being all about ideas, as opposed to being all about innovators. And so I would just, I would just kind of highlight that the, the ideas are, you know, they're somewhat important, but the real thing that's important, like if you could, if in your organization, you could find and release the potential of one human being who is a true blue innovator, that would do more to actually drive real innovation than a million ideas, you know, sitting sitting somewhere. So yeah, that's that's a really great perspective. And I appreciate you sharing that. And it it brings up um, you know, thinking through really the many things that uh, organizations can do to try and build some type of entrepreneurship culture or program. Um, you know, it, it makes me think of the innovation portfolio, right? So thinking of all that that encompasses, maybe like a labs or maybe they call it an innovation department or mm -hmm. uh, um, think of venture funds, mergers, acquisitions, um, maybe even an entrepreneur in residence, you know, how can companies really leverage the employee, employee base in that innovation portfolio? Because I think it, it's, it's important to kind of connect the dots and not have things um, uh, segmented when it comes to a company's innovation efforts. Yeah. I, the the picture that's in my mind when I think about that is is kind of a diagram that's divided into um, goals and or you know let's call it goals for lack of a better term and channels okay 
goals map in my mind to the three horizons of innovation framework that was developed by McKinsey. So, you know, horizon one are those kind of continuous improvement projects. Horizon two are typically things that, you know, the, the market has become ready and the technology has become ready. We're ready to accelerate those. So those might've been things that we were working on before, but now it's time to go. And horizon three are those things that really the time you know the 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 technology may not quite really be feasible just yet or the market window hasn't opened yet but we know it's coming and it's time to start developing our capabilities and getting ready to go so horizon one two and three um i think it's a smart thing for every organization to be thinking about that portfolio but around those three goals then you're looking again i would come back to you know that that you need those goals, and then and then the core, um, you know, thing that you're trying to harness to get to that is human will and creativity. So that human will and creativity may come from your R and D team. That human will and creativity may come from you know from startups that you've recruited into your incubator. But that that human will and creativity may come from Brendan accounting who, you know, you hadn't had no idea, uh, had an interest and an ability in this and needs to be, you know, needs to be given her shot at making those things, those things happen. So, you know, if you're trying to drive innovation in an organization, uh, the, the st stat from this uh, Jim report that I was referencing earlier is that, you know, currently, the, across a range of countries, they didn't have broken out just for the United States, but about 8% of all employees, so this was like the US, Canada, and, and Ireland, I think, uh, consider themselves to be entrepreneurs. About 56% of employees think that they have what it takes to start a startup. Now, it might be a little, it might be overrating themselves a little bit, but you know, still that that order of magnitude difference between the number who see potential, feel like they have the ability and the number of getting their shot, who wouldn't want to harness that energy and plug it in to those three goals of horizon one, two, and three? For sure. And I think, you know, just in having talked with, um, you know, middle managers, executives around this, there there is some apprehension around how do I leverage my entire employee base and would we be overwhelmed by the amount of ideation that's happening and you know um just kind of what are your thoughts on that how does it help to really guide rail that big concern that i've heard yeah i'm so glad you raised that question because i think that fear that organizations have is really springs from one little tiny design flaw. And I mean, when they envision a system, what they are envisioning is something that begins with kind of a suggestion box. And that if I say to all my employees, give me your ideas, that I am going to be overwhelmed. Well, they are absolutely right about that, right? If I said to everybody on this, you know, on this call right now, give me your ideas, I'm assuming <laughs> responsibility for your stupid ideas, right? <laughs> but so what an entrepreneurship system, like a true entrepreneurship system, as opposed to an idea management system does, is it puts a healthy back pressure on that. It, it simultaneously says, come on, kid, you got what it takes. Get in there and make this thing happen. But it also is saying, but it's tough. The standards are high. It's going to take extraordinary effort and ability from you to, to make this happen. You know, if you're willing to try, we'll get behind you, but we're not taking away the standards. We're running a business here, right? So there's kind of a fairness in that. I think it's just wonderful for the culture. I think it's I think it's actually bad for the culture for a company to sort of overpromise on those things or to lower. The bar in any way. I think the I think the bar should be very very high, but the encouragement and the support equally high to get behind the people who are willing to, you know, kind of go on that hero's journey. I can't agree more, Gray. And and one of the reasons that I chose to even have this talk is because I really do see the value in a a tool. Um, I've had mentors, uh, um, a lot of different mentors in terms of entrepreneurship, but the one thing 
you know, a single mentor mentorship program, although I really recommend, you know, entrepreneurs have mentors, that that's critical. And, and, but I, I really think that, you know, entrepreneurs, you know, depending on what department or place or position you're at in the company, you know, you may not, even, even at the highest level, you may not be aware of a project, a, an idea that was formed um, from somewhere in the company. And so having, you know, just having mentorship or, you know, having an idea, but no formal tool where it's entered into, how can you really know, you know, who you might connect with? Has this idea come up already? You know, uh, so I really see that being another thing that can really help because maybe you can identify other partners in the company who could uh, provide feedback or maybe they've had a similar idea and you kind of work together towards that or they have the connection points to those um, senior leaders who may be able to help that idea forward. Um, but I digress a little. I just I just wanted to point that out because I, from my personal experience, have seen that. And I know uh, just at your level, you've worked with so many different companies and helped them with their entrepreneurship program. So I'm curious, what have you seen, uh, you know, companies who leveraged a tool-centered model, uh, what have you seen them find most beneficial? Sometimes they don't even realize that they are experiencing the benefit, honestly, Meg, because um, you know many of my clients have begun with that, and so things just kind of worked, and they didn't know they didn't know any different. I I think that, um, you know, I think that what somebody who had had uh, you know kind of labored with this, and then and then. Uh, and then kind of changed over um, to, I, I, I'm, my choice of words for this is not so much tool centered. I would say, let's always be innovator centered, but, but technology enabled, right? That just to kind of lace together those difficult parts. I'll tell you a, a point that uh, really points a spotlight on where your innovation program will fail, okay? And that is when you think about decisions, if you, if you kind of like everybody who's sitting in on this, if you pulled out a piece of paper and just kind of drew out the basic stages of your innovation process and you, and you imagine, okay, if somebody tries to transition from this stage to the next, right? How does the decision get made? That is such a point of confusion for everybody. Like all the balls get dropped there everybody feels terrible, uh, both the innovators and the decision makers. Nobody really knows what they're doing. Um, and, and you know, you're kind of standing there saying, uh, uh, um, I've got this idea or I've got this prototype or I've got this, you know, whatever it is. And I really have no idea what to do with it next. And that, that's where I would say, thinking that through in advance, designing your end-to-end process and then being ready at those kind of, uh, you know, those transition moments to really think through, okay, what are the criteria? Who are the decision makers? What's the budget? You know, what, how do we backfill this person's role if we're sending them off to, you know, to kind of like develop and, and field the MVP of this thing? Thinking through all of those details is, is where, I mean, ostensibly you would not need technology to do that. You could do that with, I mean, well, you wouldn't need digital technology to do that. You could do that with pieces of paper and, you know, all that sort of thing. It's just that it would become very, very cumbersome and, and hard to execute on it. But that's that's where a tool like Launchpath definitely helps. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, um, Gray. So I appreciate that. And I think it's uh, definitely a common challenge when when you don't have a, a process in place for what to do with this entrepreneur's great idea that actually could, you know, bring more profits or incrementally help the company um, to just be kind of stuck because it would take so much time to figure out, okay, well, who do I go to get that funded or what, what should I even do? That makes a lot of sense. And um, thanks for 
yeah. for sharing that. Let, let me Before just give I, a little yeah. example. It might, it might help just tell a story without sharing too much details. This was not, this, this is a little example. This was, you know, kind of more one of those Horizon One innovations that a team who had never done anything like this before were doing, um, you know, for a client that, um, you know, works in a very non-technical field. This is a, a client that um, uh, works in social services. And so you can imagine that, you know, the employees are like social workers and things like this. And it was a, it was a team that, um, that was working on something they are, and they had, they had done wonderful work. They had, they had pulled together, they had worked very, very hard and they had gotten up to a certain point where they were thought it was just about to cross the finish line when they found out that a critical piece of, of technology that they were using was incompatible with the, with the IT infrastructure that they were working in. There was gonna be no way to deploy this everywhere else. And so, they had one of these meetings you know, where they're reviewing their the, kind of a, a review of their project where, where they're looking at this. And it was just so obvious that the normal answer in this situation, uh, you know, especially for a company that maybe isn't really accustomed to going through iterative cycles on things would have been, well, we tried, it failed, you know, time to shut it down. But instead they had a, mech a mechanism for, you know, uh, iterating on that and saying, okay, this has, hasn't quite worked here, but let's go back and kind of try to refine our idea for this innovation, try to solve that problem and come back. And in a matter of, you know, a couple of weeks, the team was actually able to find a new solution for that, that suddenly kind of unblocked them and helped them, you know, get to a successful conclusion on this. And it was just such a joy for the leadership as well as for the employees that, you know, they felt, they felt so good about collectively their achievement that they had they had been able to execute on this thing it's just really delightful to watch that happen yeah that is really rewarding i think you know it's just there's so many benefits to having an entrepreneurship program i know just for myself as being somebody who uh, has that entrepreneurial itch as you said you mentioned earlier the percentage of people that do you know there is a large amount of the population that is interested in this and works for a company and likes working for a company mm -hmm. um, but being able to kind of leverage their own knowledge be able to kind of uh, develop themselves through having some type of software that or something that might support them through that journey so that they could, you know, maybe their their project doesn't work out, but hey, maybe down the road from what they've learned, they can, they will grow and in a few years, maybe have something that could really benefit the company. And so in turn, they're growing. And I know um, that's something that is talked about in terms of entrepreneurship programs being uh, beneficial to, uh, you know, to have an innovative culture and to attract talent. Um, Anything uh, that you'd like to share on that that point? Sure. Yeah, well, so the, the main thing I would say about that is I don't think you can have a strong culture of innovation without actually innovating. I, I think you have to, you know, like you have to do all these things to innovate, but if you're doing a lot of stuff and it's not resulting in stories, you know, like like my own story, you know, if if you if you had a company where I join as a new employee, and after three weeks there, I've met five people who have a story like that one I told about my own career, right? Who's like, well, I came in here as a, you know, as a as a manager of a team of three people, and and now look what I've done. If yeah. if you're not if you're not getting some stories like that, you won't you won't succeed in developing that culture of innovation. So it's incredibly powerful when that, you know, when when you develop a reputation as a company for being that sort of place, right? That that people's kind of entrepreneurial dreams are are coming true inside the organization. And again, I think the fundamentals of getting there are, you know, at the deep, deep sort of foundational layer, it comes down to we've got to recruit and develop and support those innovators. And we've got to find a way to get them aligned with the 
ownership, leadership of the company and with the market. You know, there's a lot of stuff in between that has to happen to make that, to, to do all that. But if you can succeed in doing that, whether through a tool or, or black magic, you will succeed in, you know, creating your strong culture of innovation. Yeah, thank you, Gray. I appreciate that. And just all that you've shared with us here today and exploring that. Um, I'm curious to open it up to the audience and uh, Gray, if there's anything else that you're wondering about or want to discuss here this afternoon or evening, wherever you are. It, there is one thing I'd just like to add, uh, just kind of as like a book into the, to the conversation, which is just uh, a little thought about how to get started. If, if anybody has been listening to this and has found, you know, like maybe it's, maybe it's kind of renewed your interest and in we should be doing something here. I would just say that there are like, I, I really am not trying to uh, use this as an infomercial opportunity. I just don't know all the other things that are out there. But what I can say about Launchpath is that for as little as $7 per user per month, you can get sort of a complete innovation program in a box. If you do not currently have an entrepreneurship program, what I would recommend to you is get the cheapest version of Launchpath for the smallest team that you can. And and just kind of like let that be a you know a template for you. Even if you if if later you decide that you've got a better solution than all that, great. But it'll provide kind of framework and a sense of like all the pieces that need to be assembled to operate your entrepreneurship program, right? Um, but but you can sort of adjust things to get it just right for you, and then and then start scaling from there. I would just encourage you that, you know, there are really complete sort of ready to go systems that give you a starting point to make it, you know, you, you, you save yourself years of painful error <laughs> when you, when you do that. And um, so anyway, just, just want to say that opportunity exists. No, thank you, Gray. I know from just seeing like uh, demos and things that, of your software, other software, that really it, it is a, a large, uh, it's a large undertaking to really build out an entrepreneurship program. But what I love about, you know, having tools is it, somebody's thought through it, right? Somebody's, you know, you can look at these examples if you're a company and you can say, oh yeah, that, that would really work. Or I haven't considered that. Um, and, you know, I don't know, maybe some of the preconception, and I know, Gray, as being friends, we've talked about this in the past together, that, you know, there's this misconception, and maybe it was true, you know, 10 years ago, that it would be so expensive to have an entrepreneurship program, and oh, we don't want to invest that much as a company, but but now it's so affordable, just all the options that are out there, that it's really worth taking a look at and learning from. So I uh, just I really love this dialogue and just wanna open it up to anyone for any questions of Gray, myself, any thoughts, aha moments. <laughs> Feel free to come off mute or I can bring up the chat as well. Oh, okay. Very cool. There's some chat going on. Let's see here. Hi, Megan. Uh, it's Joe here from London. Hi, Joe. Uh, hi, hi, guys. Um, thanks a lot, Gray, for for um, the the talk. Um, I just wondered if. Um, you could talk a bit about how you feel the 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 tech so your solution your tool um, how it can be um, effective as a standalone product versus obviously a lot of entrepreneurship models in order for them to work you need people behind it to really um, 
you know, change the internal systems and processes and get managers and leaders on board with the process and figure out decision-making process, et cetera. So um, what's kind of your opinion on the, the trade-off between a standalone tool and actually a people and tool focused model, if that makes sense. Right, and Joe, I, I, you know, with with my product, with Launchpath, you definitely need people involved in that um it's it's not uh standalone i would say that what um so i want to be careful to try to answer your question the the thing that i think a a you know a, a digital tool like launchpath and and others do to help is uh to just make the whole development of the system a more tractable problem right so like you just mentioned you know we need to figure out how we're going to make decisions and let's say that questions that need to be answered are questions like what are our criteria and who are the decision makers okay um what a tool like launchpath does is just kind of clarify that that's what you need to do right that hey here's this kind of step and you're you're designing your system at this step in our in our system that we're designing, we need to identify what the decision who the decision making team is here, and we need to really clarify and articulate those criteria. And that sounds like a very simple thing. It is kind of a simple thing, but in reality, without some sort of guiding structure to make sure that you've checked those boxes, what happens out in the world is that people say, "Yeah, let's." get all those ideas and then we'll decide what to do with them. And then you've got a team of executives sitting around a conference room with no criteria, with no idea where this thing is going next, with no idea what the budget is. And, you know, the whole thing just, it, that, that's where it hits a kind of an irrecoverable uh, roadblock. So I hope that helped Joe, just that it's, you know, like if, if you had, uh, you know, probably the the minimum version of some sort of thing would be like a a playbook with a checklist, right? If but but I would call that a tool to support your entrepreneurship program. It it wouldn't be as efficient as it could when it was time to notify um, an innovator that their idea had been approved. You would have to go, you know, write an email message rather than that being automated. When it was time to train an entrepreneur on how in the world do you, you know, use this business model canvas, you would have to, you know, schedule a half day session and hire a trainer and do all that rather than that just kind of being embedded right in line in their experience. So it wouldn't be as efficient, it wouldn't be as scalable, but it would be a tool that would give really helpful uh, guiding structure to what you were doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot, Gray. I sure. appreciate that. And um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I tend to agree, obviously, that, that because, yeah, I work in a, a similar, similar space and, and we look to, to help corporates um, build products within and, and utilize their talent. And it's, um, it's very much, you know, we found it challenging, obviously, to set up the, the right structures internally to be able to facilitate the innovation. And I mean, for example, getting access to um, legal departments, getting access to marketing, getting access to sales and HR and embedding innovation as, as a, um, a metric on your scorecard, for example, these, these kind of things. So, so uh, utilizing kind of a, a model of your tool the, and alongside that a people focus to to really embed these kind of um processes and avenues for people to utilize resources internally i think is very important yeah and joe if i could maybe just take on one thing that i really see as somebody that works at a corporation i think you know if if that is a problem a company is having having throughout this process i think it's almost a good thing and to be revealed because then you can kind of in solving it for implementing an entrepreneurship program you're also in turn trying to 
maybe fix a broader problem at the organization, which is maybe it's a little more siloed. So how do you better connect? How are things being communicated top down? And every company right now, whether it's, you know, a new initiative or, you know, something new, they need to communicate a new effort internally, the, the, that communication piece coming from the top and working across all departments is important no matter what industry you're in. So I just think that there is opportunity to, to grow and that maybe even implementing an entrepreneurship program gives the opportunity for a company to better think through their current structure and processes in general. So just thanks for bringing up that point. And Gray, did you have um, maybe well, something else to add? Just some more comment about that. I think in an ideal world, um, when you are trying to develop your program, I kind of touched on this earlier, but I would, you know, in a large organization, there's going to be, you know, a relatively small percentage of, of high level leaders, I mean, people with, with budget um, that, that kind of get it, but there will be some, you know, it's 10, 20% of your top executives that really see the potential for innovation and they are, their own values are aligned with what we're talking about. I would begin by trying to find one of those people. And then I would try to understand what their goals are. Where do they sense opportunity? And then I would, you know, with that in mind, I would say, okay, here is the end in process that's going to convey this entrepreneurial energy and talent of your employees towards those goals and sort of get a handshake on the end to end process and budget and you know evaluation criteria, all of that stuff in advance before you flood the zone with the with the innovators, right? So that's the reason that our company is called Launch Path is because we kind of think that's the most important thing is just defining the end to end path so that when you know people like Meg who are you know just just bursting to create and to do and to and to make a contribution you know they've got a path to get there mm -hmm. awesome dialogue here um, anyone else with questions for gray or myself Oh, Andrea, yes, I see your hand. <laughs> Hi, thanks so much, Gary. That was really great. Uh, this may be more of a hypothetical, but I'm interested if you've ever been an experience or had a company that used Launchpath that on the surface was very vocally committed to innovation, but when they actually put the structure in place, realized that it was a bit more lip service than expected. Has that ever occurred where the uh, the structure exposed some underlying issues in the culture? Empire, that, please. That is, that is a common problem. I, I personally have not had one of those really frustrating experiences where, you know, a, a, an entrepreneurial team did all the right things only to get right up to the gate and be denied. But I know it happens all the time. And, um, so, so Andrea, anyway, to answer your question, no, I've not had that experience personally. Uh, yes, I'm very familiar with it. And, you know, I think that what's going on there is, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a misalignment um, with the real needs and wants of the senior leadership that's just, sadly not being exposed until deep into the process. I think that you have, you know, leaders who haven't really, who haven't counted the cost. I, I, I will say that I think one of the ways that you can, you know, potentially, I don't, you know, again, I haven't had the experience, so I don't know if this has worked, but I'm, I'll throw out this thought that to the degree that you can help those leaders count the cost before you kind of you know fire the starting gun on the entrepreneurship program. So for example, um, it's always hard to integrate some new thing into a company's technology stack. I, I think that if you haven't had a conversation up front about when we get to that point, 
where our minimum viable product is actually, you know, the customers like it, it's demonstrating results, but now this needs to be fully integrated into our operating manual and our technology stack and how we train new employees and all the rest of that, you know, will that make the, the list of the, the hundred things that IT is going to work on this year or not? You know, are we ready to kind of put that budget into it? So those nitty gritty conversations about those kind of details, uh, seeing an organization budget for those uh, so that they've, they've got the resources kind of planned in advance, I think is a, you know, is, is a good conversation to have. I, I don't know if that helps at all with what you've experienced. You know, it's very insightful. Sometimes I think you're right. They need to put the money up front into that back end, into the structure, into the IT. Yeah. You'll realize whether that commitment is just, it looks good yeah. our missions and values yeah. and to whether it's serious. Yeah. Something we do at Launchpath that I haven't seen done anywhere else before that has worked well for us has been to, um, when we're helping a client set up their new entrepreneurship program, we go through a budgeting process. We basically model their innovation pipeline for entrepreneurship and, and you know, make guesses at kind of the cost of, of developing innovations, you know, in these different, around these different goals and around these different pipelines. And then the client sets a budget, both in terms of hours and dollars that they will award to the innovators to work on those things. So unlike 20% time where it's sort of, you know, it's there and, and it's, it's at least allegedly available to everybody, it's think of it more as like a special PTO uh, kind of arrangement that, you know, Meg here can be awarded an innovation vacation of three months if need be to go work on, on this project during that time, but it's all success based. So we're, we're reserving this, this kind of special allocation of time or, you know, $50,000, you know, that's being allocated on a special success based model. Uh, but we do, we do have our clients, you know, make commitments, budgetary commitments to those things before, before they start their programs. Thank you for that question, Andrea. That was really helpful to hear, Gray. Um, 